Thank you everybody for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here on a Friday. Um, so we, this is evidence-based teaching practice. How are you incorporating evidence into your teaching practices? Um, from the Health Sciences Interest Group of ACRL. My name is Anna Ferry. I am the current convener, just about to be the outgoing convener, how exciting for me, um, of the Health Sciences Interest Group. Um, I'm really excited to have this event and really thankful to our programming committee for putting together the call for proposals and finding these two excellent presenters who are going to speak today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put into the chat um, our LibGuide, the link to our LibGuide, to the Health Sciences Interest Group LibGuide. We post information on here about who we are, what we're doing, and after this event, in addition to having the recording emailed to everybody who um, signed up for this event, we will also post the recording on our LibGuide, um, and to for any of our presenters who choose to do so, they will share their slides at that location as well. Um, so please check out that LibGuide if you want further information about our existing events, ongoing events, or other things that are going on. The last thing I want to say as the convener for the Health Sciences Interest Group is that um, this coming year with, with the new convener starts up, who will be Rosalind Odom, um, we, she, we will be uh, refreshing our programming group. So it is our, our, this is the year for our programming group to kind of refresh and, and uh, get a new group of members. So if you might be interested in that, please reach out to us. Um, please reach out to me. I'll put my email in there. And uh, we will put you on the list of potential members for the new programming group, because this programming group has done an excellent and amazing job, and we'd like to continue that great tradition. So uh, with that, I'm going to step down and let Amanda, who is part of organizing this, take over. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Tarbett. I'm a member of the HSIG Programming Committee. I'd like to say a special thank you to Sarah Sheehan, Barbara Harvey, and Diane Koloshnik, who also helped me plan this event. We have two awesome speakers for you today, Lisa Acuff and Katie Hoskins. Each of them will have 20 minutes to present, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Anna will be keeping track of your questions in the chat. Um, so ask them when you think of them, but we'll answer them at the end of the program. First up is Lisa Acuff. Lisa is the education and research librarian and an ass assistant professor at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. Lisa, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, let me just um, transition to screen share. And I am hoping that you are able to see, um, let's see. Yes. We are can. you seeing? Okay. All right, so we're all seeing presentation view, I hope. Oh no, sorry, it's still on the, it's still um, on. the user end. You want me to switch the yeah. screens? Thank you so much, yeah. I'm going to switch those up and while I am, navigating that I just want to share that I am so glad to be here today thank you for the opportunity um, I'm just trying to get my mouse there we go thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to share I'm just delighted um, is that a little better are you seeing the presentation view yet not yet okay well let me just um, try one more thing here I'm really so sorry about this. Um, I wonder if I need to just re uh, share my screen. And it looks like Katie is saying yes. So I'm going to try try this again real quick. Thanks for your patience. My suggestion: start from the beginning for sharing. Start from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, for the sharing. So. All right, going to do my best here. All right, so here we go again. Yes, I think I got it. Are we good? Yes, okay, thank you You're so good. much for your patience. All right, as I mentioned before, I'm really glad to be here today. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, the focus of my presentation today is um, 
an interprofessional education event um, that I developed at Harding University. So this was prior to my current position, which is still relatively new. Um, I just joined the faculty at the University of New Mexico in February. So um, prior to that, um, I was a health sciences librarian again. And one of my favorite things of my job was being part of the interprofessional steering committee. Um, and so today I'm going to highlight one of our events that I developed and really center the role that evidence played in this process. So moving right along, this is a roadmap for what I'd like to share today. Um, the process that I chose for developing this um, interprofessional event was a backward instructional design event. So I'll introduce that. I'll show you how I incorporated evidence into the backward design process. And finally, I'm going to share with you a template that I used to help me organize um, the instructional design steps and supporting evidence. So I hope that you'll feel free to make yourself comfortable throughout my presentation. Um, we will address questions at the end, so please feel free to be thinking of those as we go along. Um, so with that, I have two goals for my panel today, and that is one, hopefully we'll be able to apply evidence for instructional design, and two, to use a template to organize the various steps and supporting evidence. So I'd like to begin with just a little discussion and I welcome you to participate if you'd like. Um, in the chat, what does evidence-based teaching practice mean to you? You're also welcome to just think about this. Um, you're welcome to just jot a little note to yourself. This is just an opportunity for us to get thinking, for us to get thinking about evidence-based teaching practice. And, and, and what does that mean? So Anna, are you monitoring the chat right now? Since this isn't a question, would you like to just chime in with, if there are any responses? Sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. So I'm seeing um, one that says it's analogous, I can't pronounce that word, do evidence-based practice in medicine, um, a practice that has been assessed in some way that we're using the best practices in education to instruct our users. Um, and let's see, what else do I have here? Um, using data to improve my programs and workshops. Using what others have found helpful in your teaching practice. Applying many types of evidence, self-collected, published, et cetera, to continually improve the effectiveness of library instruction. Uh, using the cycle of assessment to refine and improve teaching, applying evidence into teaching practice, developing instruction on proven methodologies and not individual preference. And the last couple I've got here are teaching methods with demonstrated efficacy and using reliable evidence to design curriculum. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to everybody who shared your thoughts. I really appreciate that. So I think going on, uh, we might see a lot of these different ideas reflected in the content that I'm sharing today. So moving right along, I thought I'd begin by just telling you a little bit about the Interprofessional Steering Committee. Um, this committee was situated within the Center for Health Sciences at Harding University. And it was comprised of one faculty from each of the health sciences programs, um, which included the pharmacy, the nursing, um, PA, physician assistant, the communication sciences and disorders, um, among a couple others. And then I was also part of the steering committee. And we met throughout the year um, to come up and coordinate um, collaborative learning opportunities that would stretch across all of the different programs. Um, we also we also did assessment of our activities and our events, and we also participated in conferences where we presented on what we learned and found um, in the, the activities and research that we were doing. So today, what I'm going to highlight is 
a health literacy interprofessional simulation that we um, engaged our learners with. This was in the fall semester and it was in the evening. And the reason we chose the evening um, is because we actually hosted one interprofessional simulation each semester. We did these on Monday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. because we found that this time accommodated all of the various different health sciences programs and their schedules. Um, now, while this was not um, mandatory in many cases, many um, faculty instructors chose to make it mandatory. They included it within their curriculum for that semester, either as a required event or something um, highly motivated by some sort of extra points, for example. Um, and so what was common among all of our interprofessional simulations was the round table. We set up many round, table, round tables. Um, we started off where we could fit in one room and we grew to where we needed three or four separate rooms with round tables. And we assigned one student from each health science program to a table. Um, roughly, that was ideal. But the main idea was that we were representing all the various health science programs and students representing those around a table. Um, and in each simulation, another commonality was that our learners were presented with clinical cases that they considered and thought through together. They solved problems or completed various tasks together. Um, and often during these simulations, we um, prepared Canvas sites and or LibGuides in advance with pre-work and resources that we progressively revealed throughout the session. So they, we, um, the purpose of that was to add complexity to the case as we went on. Um, so that's a little background on the Interprofessional Steering Committee and the simulations that we did. And again, I'm going to be highlighting our health literacy simulation today. Um, the picture on the left here just represents the round table concept. And on the right, this picture is just representing the idea of health literacy in a clinical scenario. All right, now I'd like to introduce the backward instructional design that I used. Um, this was the process I used to develop this um, simulation. Now this um, process is made up of three steps. Uh, the first step, we identify the desired results. So when designing instruction, we begin clarifying the learning goals. And this is the knowledge, skills, attitudes that we want our learners to gain or to make progress toward. Um, number two, the second step is to determine the acceptable evidence. And this represents the evidence of learning, the evidence that our students achieved those desired results, those learnings and understandings. We might also call these our assessment methods. And finally, the third step represents the instructional strategies and activities. In other words, we plan the learning experiences and instruction, and this is how we teach the content. So I took this particular backward design process and I adapted it by centering evidence. And so for each step, I began brainstorming and thinking with my steering committee, different approaches, and using evidence as a guide for that thinking and brainstorming. And now I'd like to go through each step and just kind of show you what that looked like. Um, on each slide here, you'll see a couple bubbles, I guess you could say squares or bubbles, and each bubble represents just a result from the brainstorm. Um, and I'm going to show you two results for each step. So you'll see here on the left um, that, well, first, just to back up, identify desired results. For this step, this included both the broad, competence, the broad competencies, which are those big enduring ideas that we want our learners to take with them beyond the classroom um, and, and into practice, as well as the specific outcomes. And by that, I mean those 
those things that we want our learners to accomplish during the learning event, in this case, the simulation. So here I want to now share those two results um, for the brainstorm. On the left, um, the evidence for the first learning goal, which was communicate with patients, families, and communities, was the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Now the IPEC is an academic collaborative of health sciences associations, and they publish on their website core competencies. And on the right, um, the evidence for the second learning goal was a published study that you'll see cited at the bottom. Um, this study reported health science, health literacy practices and competencies specific for health profession professionals. So you'll see here um, some of those listed are some of those more specific um, learning outcomes. Now moving on to the second step in this backward design approach, determine acceptable evidence. Um, evidence of learning includes assessments as well as performance tasks for each of the learning goals. And you'll see here again, just two examples in my brainstorming. Um, evidence for the first assessment example was another published study. And we adapted this, uh, the published questionnaire reported in this article to measure our students' health literacy knowledge pre and post simulation. Um, the, strength, uh, the strengths of this particular questionnaire was its relevance. Um, the population and topic were both highly relevant. The population was medical students, and the topic was collaborative learning about health literacy. A limitation, however, of this published study um, was that the validation for this questionnaire was not reported. And the second example, the evidence for the second assessment was uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So um, AHRQ developed a patient education materials assessment tool known as PMAT. And one of the version is specific for printable materials. Um, the point of that is that it can be used to evaluate written health education materials. A strength of this assessment tool is that it is validated. However, a limitation is that it requires a user guide. Um, so that can add some time to your learning event. All right, so now I'd like to move on to step three of the backward design approach. And again, I'd like to share two different results of the brainstorm that was informed by evidence. Um, the third step is plan learning experiences and instruction. And here on the left, you'll see evidence for uh, the, the first learning strategy, which was professional expertise. So the steering committee um, used what we learned from previous simulations. I believe this was the fifth simulation that we had done at this time. So we used what we learned to create the introductory lecture for this particular um, health literacy event. And evidence for the second learning activity was another published study. We modified one of the activities reported in this article. And for this activity, learners first viewed a clinical case video, and then they collaborated to improve the provider's, the provider, provider's oral communication. Um, and they did that with plain language and teach back principles. So those are the three steps and I highlighted just how I began by brainstorming um, ideas for each of these steps um, grounded in evidence. So now I want to show you how I put them all together. So after using the evidence to brainstorm and think about each design step, the steering committee put them all together into a table. And this is an excerpt from the completed table. You'll see how it aligns competencies, outcomes, assessments, and learning activities in a backward design order. So um, in this table, you'll see that we have one, two, three different rows, um, all kind of showing you how all of these different steps 
are um, linked together. Now, it is a little confusing perhaps that there are four columns and there are only three steps in the backward design process. However, we chose to break up the first step, which was um, the outcomes into competencies and outcomes because we thought it was important to include both those broad big areas um, that we want them to take away and transfer into their practice, as well as those more specific student learning outcomes. So really the first two rows um, kind of encompass together step one of backward design. All right, I'd like to take just a moment now and invite your participation if you'd like in the chat. What is your go to evidence for teaching practice or instructional planning and design? And we'll do it the same way as before. Anna, if you don't mind, if you just like to uh, read some of those responses. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see what we get here. Nothing in the chat yet. Nothing in the chat. All right. I'll we'll just give it a couple a little bit longer. And if nothing appears, we can just move on. Oh, here we go. We've got a couple here. Yeah, but there's um, definitely no hurry. So we got backwards design plus some iterative design and talking to colleagues about what works for them. Then we've got demonstrations of learning through successful completion of assignments. I've got I always try to follow backward design principles when planning, which like, mm, awesome. You. I love black, backwards design too. So I get that feel. <laughs> um, I use the backward design process, but usually I talk to other librarians in my system about what they have done with similar learning goals. Uh, evidence from library education literature. Yeah. Another person. Oh, this is all very helpful and I really appreciate the additions that were um, shared and suggested to add on to the backward design approach, you know, for example, also using that iterative design which reminds me of our continuous quality improvement and, you know, while the backward design does suggest a linear pro process. Um, in practice, my process really doesn't look entirely linear. I'm kind of brainstorming all things together and sometimes I'm using post-it notes and moving things around. Sometimes I choose a more visual um, approach, but kind of keeping that backward design ideology or pedagogy in the background. So I really appreciate all those um, additions. I have just a slide here that's just sort of representing a list of potential sources that could be sources for any of those um, steps, step one, two, or three of the backward design process. Um, professional expertise could include, I think, both the health sciences faculty as well as our librarian and health information colleagues. So um, the research, of course, could include our literature in teaching and learning literature evidence base, um, library practice, nursing education, etc. So oh, I also included here student evaluations and I just wanted to point that out because I, um, I never want to un underestimate the importance of the learner. And in fact, I really like to center the learner and how they experience the learning and what they need. Um, and so that kind of brings me to this little, the evidence categories that we often see when we're thinking about evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice in a more clinical kind of environment. Um, thinking about this for teaching, I like to think of it perhaps as our learners, our professional knowledge and expertise, and then our research. And I like to put learners first because I, I really like to remind myself to respect our learners because they bring so much knowledge and so much experience and taking the time to really understand um, what they bring and um, to collect their evaluations, their reflections is an important point 
um, of evidence to inform our quality improvement of education, our design, professional knowledge and experience, our experience, our colleagues counts as solid evidence as we keep learning as we go along. And then I like to think of research as creating an ongoing conversation that research evidence informs our teaching and instruction. But then we take from that and we generate new knowledge and the story goes on. And so um, maybe we can, maybe we report our findings and learnings in the literature or at a conference or in some sort of venue like this, or even more informally. So um, I wanted to end with just a quick summary, bringing us back to the key points at the beginning, um, just talking about backward design is just one approach. I do find that it's helpful for um, encouraging an, an intentional design process. Um, and then here, since the point of our, our panel and our time together today was about evidence, was just really centering how we can apply evidence to each step and using that from the beginning. And then one way to align the steps and evidence is by using a template, as I shared with you today. And again, that's just one way. Um, but I would like us to take a moment um, to reflect. And if you would like to do this just on your own, on a piece of paper, in your mind, mentally, um, or if you'd like to share something in the chat, what is one thing you plan to apply from this session? Um, so take your time to go ahead and think about that. Um, I'm not sure that we have any hurry because I do think that we're waiting for the questions till the end. But again, go ahead and, and think about this reflection if you would like. Also, you're welcome to keep thinking of questions or other ideas to share um, that we'll look at again at the very end of our time together today. And Anna, please feel free again if there are things in there that you think that um, you would like to share, please feel free to do so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, somebody has already commented about um, liking the template matrix approach to organizing the backward design principles um, and that it reminds them of logic modeling. Mm. Um, and somebody else responded similarly to really liking the, the template for helping to organize lesson planning. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm a big fan of logic models as well. Um, yes, and I see that they are a very similar tool. Uh, we do, uh, just to confirm it now real quick, even though I know we're saving questions till the end, um, so I'll, I'll if you have a question for Lisa, I will, I'll bring it up at the end. But I did want to uh, ask, somebody asked about sharing the template for like that, oh, yeah. that map. Okay. Is yes. that something we can post on the Health Sciences Interest Guide? Yes, thank you so much for asking, Anna. In fact, yes, I've already shared a link for that. Okay. Yeah, Lisa, um, do you want me to put it in the chat? I do have it right here. Yeah, you know, you're welcome to put it now as well as the link to the slides I've made available as well. Um, yeah, please do. And hopefully we can also put those on the LibGuide just as another access point for those materials. And I, I just wanna end by saying thank you so much. My last slide is for questions, but of course we'll uh, save those for the end. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, my very last slide here, we have some um, references. These references are just to, to the articles that I cited. Um, there are hyperlinks embedded within the slides to the other things. And so the link to the slides should get you access to those as well. Um, but I just really wanted to thank you for being part of this and for all that you chose to share. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm done. But again, thank you, for, thank you for your time and being present today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank so you so much, Lisa. Along. That was very interesting. It's always exciting to see uh, an yeah. interprofessional simulation that is successful to the point where you've done it like five times now. That's great. Um, all right. So our next speaker is Katie Hoskins, who is the research and instruction librarian at California Health Sciences University. Katie, whenever you're ready. 
Thank you, Amanda. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, you are good. Thank you so much. Wanted to just be sure. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for having me here today. I'm going to be talking about why learning objectives are important. And it seems like many of you might already be familiar with this. And we're going to talk about how to use some formative assessment techniques to provide evidence of learning. I know Amanda just introduced myself, but I had this in here anyways. I've been a professional librarian since 2012. In addition to my MLS, I have a master's degree in learning design and technology that has been super beneficial to my librarian practice. I also participated in ACRL's immersion program for assessment that has also been very beneficial. What I'm hoping that we can accomplish in our brief time together today is that you're going to be able to identify elements of measurable learning objectives and that you'll also be able to explain how formative assessment techniques can evaluate learning. So I do have a poll question here for the audience so I can get a better idea of if you could please pick a statement that best describes your experience writing learning outcomes and or slash objectives. So everyone should be able to see the poll and I'm seeing we are getting responses. I'll shut it off when we are at 100 or close to total participation. about 15 more seconds and then I'll close the poll. Okay, closing and sharing results. Okay, so this is um, helpful to see here so that a good portion of people either occasionally write the learning objectives or frequently or always write them. So thank you for sharing. That is helpful to know. Most of what I'm going to be talking about barely scrapes the surface of this topic, but it's a good introduction and perhaps a refresher for those that are more experienced. But I definitely welcome your comments in the chat as we go through this. So first and foremost, is there a difference between learning objectives and learning outcomes? Some people will say tomato, tomato. I admit I do use the terms often interchangeably. That being said, there technically is a difference between an objective and an outcome in the learning sciences field. So an objective is generally what we are talking about from an instructor program or, a, a program or institution. And from that perspective of what are we trying to accomplish? In contrast, a learning outcome describes in measurable terms what a learner can do as a result of the learning activities. So they're much more learner-centered and give that expectation there of what they can accomplish. So the objectives are really helpful for us as the facilitators because it's helpful for the students to know what's expected but that is part of that backwards design process that Lisa was also talking about, where we start with our end goal in mind, because this drives our materials, our assessments, and everything else. We also then can tie these to um, the ACRL framework, standards for our institution, even um, the EPA standards. I work at with a College of Osteopathic Medicine, so those are the core and trustable professional activities. Hopefully I'm remembering the acronym right. So, but the point being is that there technically is a difference. In this case, if you use them interchangeably, that's fine. I have some general tips here for writing learning outcomes to make them more effective. And starting with that they're learner-centered. So not what are we going to do as the instructor, but what is the learner going to be able to know and or do as a result of the instructional activities. 
that it is outcome based. And by that, that's more instead of just being task based, that they're going to be really focused on the short term. Like an example that I found is they'll be able to demonstrate on a mannequin the four steps to administer CPR. That's really um, very focused on one specific task versus just being able to administer the four steps of CPR is much more broad and outcome based. And I think a lot of times that's what we're looking for with our profession is we don't want students to just be able to do something for an assignment. We want them to go forward and to be able to use these skills in their in a, a variety of different ways. My last suggestion is that you make your objectives, your outcomes smart, which you've probably have heard of in relation to smart goals. So SMART stands for specific, so very clear, that it's measurable. And that's a big thing for an outcome. We need to be able to find a way to try and measure it, which can be very challenging at times. Achievable, that also ties into that time sensitive piece. So if, do you have 30 minutes? Do you have two hours? What can you realistically achieve in that time frame? And also that it is relevant. So, and that's gonna really be very context specific and depend on what that context is. So I have an example here. I'll give you a moment to read this and then we'll talk about it. So if you don't mind in the chat, if you could share, do you think that this outcome that I have written here is learner-centered? Katie, do you want me to share these? No, it's okay. I see um, mostly yeses, but I do see a number of nos um, and some with question marks. So some people are not sure. Um, anybody want to share why they think that it is learner centered? I think someone did say like that it, um, it says students will. So somebody did think that it was learner centered in that sense. If you think no, why do you think that it is not learner centered? Okay. Understanding doesn't mean be able to put in practice, not measurable. You cannot measure, understand. Um, so definitely some other components here that we're also talking about. Um, so I do think that this is learner-centered because it's coming from the students will be able to um, do this. Outcome-based, I'm reading several different things here. Um, you know, some people do think it is outcome-based. Um, others do not think it is outcome based with SMART. So, I mean, and this is a discussion, right? <laughs> so, I'm trying to think here as we go uh, through this, that it may or may not be outcome based, but hopefully that still is open and isn't just about a task. Is it SMART? All of those elements, it doesn't necessarily meet all of them. Some people talk about needs an action verb, demonstrate the five A's. Yes, that's the big thing is there's not a statement about how they will show that understanding, that big verb. Um, how will they demonstrate that understanding? So you're all bringing up excellent points about why this is really not a good, um, I, should say, I should not say good, not the most effective learning outcome because we need to be more specific and how are we going to measure this? So thank you everyone for sharing. That was all I really had about that topic because I only have 20 minutes. So, but at least that hopefully gives you a good grasp of what is, um, what are some of the components that make it effective and measurable. So my next question for you is what best describes your experience using assessment techniques to evaluate achievement of learning outcomes or objectives? Poll is launched. Thank you, Amanda.
I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. Okay, ending poll and sharing results. Okay, so once again, this isn't too surprising based on that a lot of people tend to write objectives that um, at least, uh, well, actually almost a third occasionally uses assessment techniques. Thank you for sharing. So there's two different type, main types of assessment when we talk about it. There's formative assessment and then summative assessment. And perhaps one way to think of it is formative is think of it as forming and ongoing, whereas summative is the sum, so that end. The formative assessment assesses that learning on the ongoing basis. It can help both the instructor as well as learners to identify areas that where they need to do a little bit more work. Summative assessment is high stakes evaluation and tends to occur at the end of an instructional unit and can be the form of a final exam or a project. So what I'm gonna be talking about here for us as librarians um, and library uh, professionals is formative assessment techniques, which are a little bit, can be a little easier to do as well. So I am curious here, what are some formative assessment techniques you've heard of? Um, Amanda's gonna put a link in here to the answer garden and I'll go ahead and move it over so I can see your answers in real time, which is also anonymous. Except maybe I picked up the wrong link. Ha. Um, nope, that's the right one. Well, for me on the end to show the responses. Oh, <laughs> oops. <laughs> I picked the wrong one. Oh, well. Um, but then maybe you could just put it in the chat instead. I'm sorry, since I goofed up on that one. I was supposed to be able to show things. I'm seeing some now. Are you? Didn't see them until I submitted an answer. Oh, okay. Thank you for telling me that. It's been a little while since I've used Answer Garden. Okay, yes. Think, pair, share, one minute paper, polling, in class discussion, minute paper, games. Okay. And thank you for commenting in the chat as well. The one minute paper, think, pair, share. Thank you so much for sharing. Those are definitely some very um, commonly used uh, formative assessment techniques. And just because they're common does not mean that they are bad or ineffective. They're really easy to use and can be helpful. So um, there's this great book and it's pictured here. It's called Classroom Asse Assessment Techniques for Librarians. So whether you are really familiar and you use it a lot or this is new to you, I highly recommend it. Uh, they organize a bunch of these different techniques by categories such as, oh good, so Jenny says she loves that book. Me too, obviously, since I'm recommending it. It groups them by assessing prior knowledge and understanding or topics like assessing skill and analysis and critical thinking. So when it goes into these different techniques, it talks about like for this minute paper, when to use it, some different variations, um, different examples, as well as how to score it and what to do with the results. So I re definitely recommend this book if you haven't read it before. One of my favorites that I really like to do at the end of a session, um, but I don't do this for every session, but it's a three, two, one. I like to do it as three things you learned during the session today, two questions you still have after today's session, and one thing you will do differently as a result of what you learned today. So those three things help me to, I can connect that back to my outcomes and going, okay, so this is what they learned and how it measures up to this. The two questions, those I will follow up with. So sometimes if I have the students' names and I can connect it to their responses, I can respond individually. Or sometimes I will send an email to the professor or the faculty member that summarizes all of the questions and the answers. And a lot of times those questions are the nice to know things that I just couldn't get to in the time that I had. But sometimes it's things that, oh, I could have elaborated more on that. 
the final thing of being able to see what they're going to do differently, that's a great opportunity for the learner to be able to reflect on their learning. There's a lot of evidence that supports metacognitive reflection, but it's also really great as the facilitator to be able to see what somebody is going to do differently. So I'm going to show you this in action. I did a 30 minute session in a graduate level pharmacy course where students were going to be writing a paper about the healthcare status of a specific population. The faculty member wanted the students to be able to find credible resources to use in their papers. I'll be honest, I did not write learning outcomes for uh, the session. I tend not to for 30 minutes because it can be um, a good amount of work to write effective outcomes, but I always do it for longer classes. But it, it, to, the important thing to know is here is I discuss different research tools and strategies that would help them to locate the kind of information that they need and help with their research process. So when I asked them three things you learned during the library session today, somebody said, I learned about Grammarly. Okay, that was one of the tools that I talked about. They talked to, um, they said how to do a more efficient search in Google Scholar. That was one of those research strategies I, that I covered. They said that they learned how to add new information to the search engine to narrow down the results. So all of those are great strategies. Um, I liked from the second comment here to get the help that I need. That's always one of my big takeaways during an instructional session is if nothing else, feel comfortable coming back to me for help. So I was really pleased that I could see that from the responses, I could connect that back to my objectives of at least that they'd be familiar with these resources and tools. Then for two questions that they had, uh, how can we know about how accurate the information we are getting is from Google searches? What is a good resource to find clinical trials? Those are definitely things I did not cover in my 30 minutes because I had a really limited amount of time and focused on the most critical pieces. But those are great things that I can follow up with, as well as the other question about learning more about citing the different resources. So the last thing that I had asked them was to describe one thing that they would do differently as a result of what they learned. And some of the responses said, give PubMed a shot. Um, doing research for a topic, they would use some of these different tools taking advantage of our reference manager SciWheel. So these also give me insight and tie that back to those objectives that I had for that they'd be able to have these research tools and strategies that would help them. And that can tie back into, again, those overarching goals for your institution, for what you want your graduates to be able to do or your population, as well as the overall other kinds of goals. So that's everything that I wanted to cover today. It's a really basic introduction that uh, may not be anything new for some of you. The last thing I wanted to just say is a little bit of encouragement that, and you may have heard this quote, that perfect is the enemy of good. A friend of mine, when I told her about this, she said, it's also the enemy of done. <laughs> so just don't be afraid if you don't really do it to go out there and try it. And there's challenges, of course, whether people are too busy, um, you know, that they have a lot on their plates, or you're just afraid that it's going to flop. It does happen where things don't always go well. But all of those things, it's like um, somebody else said, done is better than perfect. And I've also definitely learned that lesson being a parent. <laughs> so the last thing that I wanted to share before we get into, I uh, hand this so back over to Anna, is you're welcome to reach out to me directly. I have a link here for a Padlet. And that has, if you feel comfortable sharing, you know, something you learned is a question. But I also have an opportunity there for you to list some resources that you might find helpful, whether it's for writing outcomes or doing formative assessment. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. I have actually never heard of 321. And as you were talking about it, I'm already thinking about how I'm going to start using that. So very excellent. Um, Anna, do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, um, please do put, if you are thinking of questions only now, please go ahead and put them in there and I'll be watching for them. Um, Lisa, I pulled uh, a couple for you from earlier. Um, one of them was somebody who was commenting on um, that I have been discouraged from using student evaluations because they're already too busy. Does anyone have thoughts or recommendations um, on this kind of pushback? 
And she did get a couple of responses, including doing polls and surveys during the class um, to assess her learning. Um, somebody said that they do online worksheets during the class so that she, they can download and review those worksheets later and see what they did. Um, and somebody said doing a pre and post survey of their gaps in their knowledge so that they can see the difference between those things. So I don't know if you have something to add or like what else you would say in terms of the student evaluation, don't do it, push back. Yes, I, I get that. Um, thank you for asking that question. I do have a couple thoughts. I'm going to also put my email in the chat because I, I think that I neglected to include it on my slides. Um, but as far as student evaluations, um, when I think of that, I'm thinking of more of um, something akin to a patient satisfaction or experience survey, where I'm wanting to see what the learning experience was like to the student. So this is a little bit different than measuring the um, whether or not they achieved those understandings and learnings that we set out for. So I, I I really enjoy reflective practice. And so I have this ongoing list that is hanging up right next to me of, I'd say even evidence-based reflection questions that I've kind of borrowed from the literature, borrowed from colleagues, um, kind of collected over time that um, I generally select two to three of those questions that fit best the purposes of my instruction. And I invite the learner to answer one of them. So I really like to give learners a uh, choice. So by providing two to three options and allowing them that choice, and um, that's, that's often how I do it. I, I sometimes, depending on the situation, I like to make time for that in the classroom at the end. I find that we often get more responses, but a lot of times the faculty will work with me and really encourage um, there are students to do it after the fact. I tend to use Poll Everywhere quite a lot because our institution has a subscription and there's a lot of support for Poll Everywhere. So I often use Poll Everywhere to gather uh, reflection. Based on time, that's all I'm gonna share with you today, but that's probably my number one strategy to get uh, student evaluation information if I am limited. I'd be curious to see what other approaches are in that book that Katie shared though, actually. Uh, the other one I had that came up during your um, session, Lisa, is uh, somebody just asked the general question, does anyone else teach asynchronous? And I wanted to highlight that because it, first, it didn't get further conversation, unfortunately, um, but also because I think that, that that is very relevant to these discussions today as well is um, how do we apply this into asynchronous teaching practices? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe the, the person could insert a little bit more. I think what I presented today doing a simulation would be a little bit difficult to do um, in that way. I, I, from my experience at our institution, we kind of put on hold a lot of our um, in-person interprofessional simulations that really were highly interactive um, and we did modified approaches. So I will just be very, clear and honest that what I shared today was something that we absolutely did completely in person, but I still believe that this approach is highly effective and I still apply it to my, um, my as asynchronous teaching. Um, and as far as when I create self-directed learning materials, I at the very least try to use the approach um, and the thought process to put it together. And I've created a completely self-guided curriculum um, that's comprised of five different modules. And I used this very um, tool, a template, but also just sort of this order of planning events, this sort of backward process order. So yeah, thank you for asking. I hope I asked, um, answered it or was you know, a little clear. Um, Katie, I'm going to jump over to a question for you now. Um, the first was, uh, do you write new outcomes for every longer, more than 30 minute class? Um, this person says, I tend to use the same outcomes for most of my classes, uh, limiting some for undergrads versus grad students. 
Thank you, Anna. That's a good question. I have outcomes for every session that's definitely longer than 30 minutes because that drives my, my activities. What am I going to cover as well as the assessment piece? But I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with reusing some of your objectives and or outcomes and adding or dropping if you're happy with them and they can help guide things and they effectively um, will uh, cover what you want to and uh, will help you, the learners, to achieve the skills um, and knowledge that they need, then absolutely, I think that's a great thing to do. Uh, the next question for you was, what format do you use for the three to one assessment? Online form, paper, app? <laughs> I do use it. Um, um, I, we have Microsoft Forms through our office collection. And then so usually what I do is, um, and you'll see it on the Padlet, I, um, my favorite one for doing QR codes. So I can put it right there on the slide and I'll add a URL. So whether they want to do the URL or scan it, then they can do that. And then it's just, I think it's easy for a lot of people that are at my particular university. If it were um, at the community college where I used to work, I might, I did it a lot of times in paper which is a little bit more challenging when you're trying to look at the responses afterwards, but um, that was um, helpful too. So I've done both. And then the other question you got was, do you share your learning outcomes with the faculty member you are uh, working with or ever write the outcomes with the faculty member? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't usually write the outcomes with a faculty member. Sometimes if we are doing something collaboratively, like more so where both of us are going to be talking, not just me, then there's some work there together. Sometimes I will share it because I will often then create an outline for, well, here's the course objectives, here's my objectives, and then here's what I'm going to do. And so sometimes I share that with a faculty member if they're interested, and then they'll be able to see it all. Right. I think we've caught all the questions that weren't related to just resharing links to to materials and things um, in here. But we got several more people who are just responding in and giving further, um, you know, their thoughts on some of the um, questions that were asked. Um, and I just like some of this conversation is great. So the for asynchronous leaning on instructional design principles and to techniques even more um, because they feel a little more out of their element um, than asynchronous or hybrid. Um, and also a comment back to the uh, asynchronous one as well from the original um, question asker was that everything was in campus. So it's a lot of Panopto videos and get maybe an hour of introduction um, in there. So that's just a little like giving the context for what they were doing. But it looks like other than that, people are just saying thank you, which I will reinforce. Thank you both very much. It was awesome. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you to everyone who attended. We hope that you found this valuable and you learned something new. Um, you should be getting emails with a link to the recording at some point. Um, but yeah, it's three o'clock. Everyone have an awesome, rest of your day and awesome weekend. Thank you. Thanks everyone.